Good afternoon. It is December uh, 23rd, and this is our third session on the book of Revelation. And you see today that our topic is uh, Hope in a Catholic World, Session 7, A Cosmic View. Uh, today, we're going to look at Revelation 12, 13, and 14. And these uh, chapters again, take a, a much higher level view of things. So uh, chapters four and five were a heavenly view. Chapter six focused its judgments on uh, the way that humans treat each other. Uh, the cycle of trumpets that we looked at last week uh, focused on natural disaster more than anything. Uh, but this week we have really, uh, again, a heavenly view. What is going on at the highest possible level? And again, we want to be careful that we don't see these things as sequential. I've said this before, say it again. Um, these are not one after the other kinds of things, but these are descriptions of the entire era of the church's life. So... Um, <clears throat> Today, we start with uh, what comes across as a story, although in many cases, uh, the, the story that we're looking at um, doesn't, again, follow chron chronologically exactly in order. We, we'd be misunderstanding it if we saw it that way. Let's, let's, let's start out here. Um, Revelation chapter 12. Let me just pull it up here so we can take a look at it together. Um, this, of course, is going to be Bible Gateway, which I think is just a tremendous, tremendous online asset. So here we have it, a great sign appeared in heaven. Uh, a great sign, not just a sign, but a great sign. So we're supposed to take note here. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Um, so this is pretty glorious language, clothed with the sun, she, she shines. Um, we call uh, similar, you know, Jesus in chapter one, uh, shown with this inner glory. So this is a very uh, significant thing that she shines with the sun. Uh, the moon is under her feet, uh, maybe reminiscent a little bit of Joseph's dream way back in Genesis, when Joseph uh, dreamt that um, his father and mother would bow down to him. He saw the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him. And then a crown of 12 stars in her head, 12 being the key thing here, 12 identifying this woman as the, um, the church in some way. So 12, we've seen this number before, uh, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles of Jesus, 24 elders around the throne. Uh, so the fullness of, of God's people. And what we have here seems to be a description of Israel as God sees her, as God has clothed her. So in her holiness and glory, uh, we'll come to this in a second. She will do what she was meant to do and bear the Messiah. Uh, this is Genesis 12, when Israel is pulled out, Abraham is told all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. So Israel's purpose is to bring us to the promise. The promise is Jesus. And then the woman continues to exist. And the woman continues to exist because the church in the New Testament is identified as Israel. Not Israel according to the flesh, but Israel by faith. And, and you can read Romans about that. So here's this woman. Uh, at once Israel and the church, depending on which side of Jesus she's on, uh, she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Uh, I guess the point being that Israel had a hard time waiting. It took a long time for the Messiah to come. Um, and when they, when they were there, they had been under foreign occupation for 600 years. You had uh, Babylonians and you had Persians and Greeks and now Romans when Jesus was born. And that would have been the crying out in pain. Some commentators want us to think of this as a personification of the Virgin Mary. Um, I think that's probably a little too specific in this case. Um, although ver the Virgin Mary certainly was the one who bore the Son of God, who bore this, the Messiah, I think here we have Israel 
in, in view because of the, the 12 stars. Um, so a woman, and then um, let me just uh, share a different, a different image with you that would give you some sense of this, uh, this picture here. Uh, this is Albrecht Durer's woodcut on these, uh, on these chapters. And here you have the woman um, with her crown of stars and standing on the crescent moon there. Um, not sure, quite sure how he's showing her clothes with the sun. And then we have a dragon who opposes her. And uh, the dragon has seven heads and wears a number of crowns and has a number of horns. Uh, one thing I like about Durer's work is if you'll notice up here um, that God is always the one who is in control. So um, despite the, the ferocity and the, the, the terror of the picture, uh, Durer recognizes that God is always in control. So we've talked about the woman, and now uh, we have a dragon who opposes her, and uh, that takes us back then to, uh, to Revelation 12, where we see um, an enormous red dragon. Um, so red, I suppose, can sometimes be thought of as the blood of the martyrs, but it is typically blood, and um, it is typically a, a kind of a bad color. Um, and a dragon is never a good thing. I mean, I don't care if you're a science fiction fan. And maybe back in the 80s, you read the Dragon Riders of Pern and you thought, oh gosh, you know, dragons are kind of cool. Maybe more recently you read the, the trilogy Aragon and thought, oh, dragons are so cool. But uh, dragons in the Bible don't come up very often, but when they do, they're, they're monsters. Um, now this monster, interestingly enough, has seven heads and seven crowns and 10 horns. And seven, of course, is, is God's number. So that this dragon is in some ways living either what we'd say in imitation of God or probably more accurately in mockery of God, uh, that he casts himself this way. Um, and again, I didn't look this up and I should have, um, but I think it's in the Gospel of John. That, that Satan is described as one who masquerades in the light. Maybe we should look that up, shall we? Let's see if we can find that real quick here. See if it keys to the, the keyword masquerade. I don't know if it does or not. It kind of depends on what translation you're using. Um, yeah, here it is. Second Corinthians. I'm sorry, it was Second Corinthians. For no wonder. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. So those are two important verses that sort of verify this identification of this dragon. He, he is demonic, but he masquerades as the child of the light. Now its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Um, John will actually come back to this idea, I think, in uh, a few verses here um, with the fall of, of angels along with the Satan. Um, and the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment he was born. Um, so Satan is in opposition to Jesus from the get-go. Um, and, and maybe what we have here is just sort of a veiled allusion to Matthew chapter 2 and uh, Herod's reaction after the Magi ask him where the king of the Jews is and they don't go back to him so he rages and he kills all the baby boys of Bethlehem um, but but Satan is in opposition to Jesus from the from the start um, so he is there waiting to devour him the moment he is born that the child is in fact Jesus is seen here in verse 5 she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will, I like the quotes here, rule all the nations with an iron scepter. It's a quote back to um, Psalm 2, one of the Messianic Psalms. Um, so a psalm about the Messiah who will rule the same way. And then her child was snatched up to God and to his throne, uh, a reference to the end of Jesus' ministry. So what we have here is um, we have Christmas all the way in the beginning of Jesus' life, all the way through uh, Easter, 
er, ascension and the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. So you have here a sort of cosmic telling of this tale of salvation. Um, Israel is in labor with the Messiah. The Messiah is born. The dragon opposes the Messiah all through his life. Uh, the child, the Messiah, sits at the right hand of God. And then verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. So we need to think a little bit here about uh, the nature of the, uh, the wilderness and uh, this 1260 days. Uh, the wilderness is a complex metaphor in Israel's history. Um, it is the place of their, of their wandering. So it is the place of their testing. Um, but in the prophets, uh, especially Hosea, it also becomes the place of uh, God's wooing. It is a place of um, spiritual renewal. Uh, it's not an accident that John the baptizer stands on the banks of Jordan, and, and he is in the wilderness, uh, on the border of the wilderness and the Holy Land. That's, that's by design that he is there. So she is taken to the wilderness, and in some ways, you can read that as her, her persecuted existence that we talked about last week. And yet at the same time, there is this language of her being protected. Uh, so kind of a, a dual purpose kind of thing going on there with this notion of going to the wilderness. But it's a place prepared for her and she is taken care of there. So although we have a, uh, a terrible, terrible picture of, uh, you know, a dragon trying to eat a baby and there's the, the child being snatched up into heaven. Um, although we have this really horrible uh, picture here um, the, the message is clear. God is the one who is in control and God protects. Now that 1260 days, that, that's one of the ways that just Revelation regularly talks. 1260 days is 42 months is three and a half years. Three and a half years is first of all, not seven, right? So seven is, is God's time. It's, it's the fullness of, of God's time. Seven is God's number. Um, so three and a half is a way of saying this is not the divine time. This is not God. Uh, this is something else. It's, it's a period of time, a shortness of time, maybe even call it half a time. But the point is, is it's circumscribed. There's an end to it. It, it won't go on forever and ever. So three and a half is this way to say it. And it's done with three and a half. It's done with 42 and it's done with 1260. And that's how the math works out each time. And then there is war in heaven. And uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the Revelation passage again and see this war in heaven. So this, this part is the story of salvation, right? The coming of Christ and the protection of the church until the last day. Um, and then war broke out in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Uh, Michael is an archangel. Um, he is named in the book of Jude, and he is first named in the book of uh, Daniel, where he is the, the, the archangel who guards the nation of Israel. So this is an archangel, um, and he has a host of angels at his, at his side. Uh, they fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth and his angels with him. Now, this part's a little speculative, and, you know, maybe I sh shouldn't go there, but I'm going to go there anyhow. It's interesting to think about Satan. Uh, there's no place in the scripture that really just stops and says, okay, Let's talk about angels. Let's talk about fallen angels. Let's talk about Satan. So the things that we know are, are interesting. Um, Genesis 2.1 says that God completed all of his work of creating. He rested from all of it. 
So everything is created in the six days, including the angels. Somewhere between chapter one and chapter three, probably between chapter two and chapter three, the angels fall. Because in chapter three, we're introduced to the serpent, who is the craftiest of all the creatures. So someplace between Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, the angels fall. And maybe that's what's being referenced up here. Uh, the dragon sweeping a third of the stars out of the sky and fleeing them to earth. Um, and then the Jesus moment happens and there is war in heaven. Um, so bear with me for a second. The book of Job, uh, chapters one and two, introduce Satan. Now, now, Satan is not typically, it's not in the first instance a name. It, it's a common noun. Uh, literally, it is the Satan, in, in Hebrew, ha-satan, and he is the, the prosecutor or the accuser. It's kind of a legal word, the prosecuting attorney. And in Job 1 and 2, uh, Satan is, is before the throne of God. All the angels are, are sort of in parade in front of God, and Satan comes along with them, and um, God asks him where he's been. He's been wandering to, to and fro on the earth. But, but the thing that's noticeable there in Job is that Satan is in the presence of God, presumably making his accusations as he does against Job. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 11, um, Jesus has his disciples returning from their mission, and they're excited that even the demons obey them in Jesus' name. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And maybe that's kind of the image here. Maybe when Jesus is born, then suddenly Satan is banished from God's presence. That when Jesus does his thing from birth to death and resurrection, this is the moment when, when Satan is shut out from the presence of God. So Romans 8 never mentions Satan. But in Romans 8, Paul is very, very clear. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If God is for us, he ponders, who can be against us? <clears throat> so who's going to lay an accusation upon us? I'm looking here. I'm looking for the, for the passage right now. Um, but it's all through Romans 8. I, I, I commend it to your, to your study. If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who will bring a charge? So the accuser is no longer the accuser. And I wonder if that's what we're supposed to be thinking here, that, that Satan had a more or less free hand until Christ appeared. And once Christ appeared, he is cast out of God's presence. He can no longer do his accusing work against God's people because their sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. Um, this would go along then well with. Um, I believe it's Revelation 20, we'll come to in a, a week or two, when um, Satan is bound for a thousand years. And the idea is, is that, that he's not able to do this kind of accusing work. Anyhow, it's, it's interesting to think about what, what's going on here, but this seems to be a sort of cosmic view of salvation history um, with, with uh, Satan himself finally banished in the work of Christ away from, from God. Um, then there's a song. Um, it seems like there's always a song in Revelation. Then I heard a loud voice. Now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Remember Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He has authority even over Satan. For the accuser, the Satan of our brothers, who accuses them, Satan's them, before our God night and day has been hurled down. They triumphed over him, that's the brothers and sisters, right, the Christians, triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So they have been washed clean, as Romans uh, Revelation 7 says, 
and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So their testimony is that they will be faithful to the Lamb uh, to the very end. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you, filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. Judgment is coming. Uh, he only has three and a half years. Okay, uh, verse 13 then. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman, that's the church, who had given birth to the male child. So um, Israel, the church, kind of the, the same being. It, it's God's holy people. The, wom the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. A callback then to, um, uh, to the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, um, God says, I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm on wings like an eagle. And that's the point of the, the vision here of the eagle. Uh, the view uh, is, is the soaring and the almost effortless flight um, that an eagle takes uh, as, as, as it sort of just soars a, a along. Um, and then she's taken to the wilderness. We've talked about that before. And there are uh, a time, times and a half a time. This is probably a Greek play on a Hebrew piece of grammar called a dual form. Um, the dual form is a, plural, a specialized plural form when you have two things. So the plural of hand would often be uh, in the dual form because you have two of them. Same thing with the eyes. Anything that's paired uh, will often take a, a plural in the dual form. So as opposed to an indiscernible number of times, what you have here is one time, two times, and a half a time, which is three and a half times, which is three and a half years, which is 42 months, which is 1260 days. And again, the point is for a circumscribed period of time, in this case, it is the period from Christ's ascension until his second coming. And they are out of the servant's reach. Uh, re recall what Jesus promised, right? No one can snatch them out of my hand. Uh, th this whole language, we get tied up in the, the dragon and the pursuit of the dragon, the rage of the dragon, and we sometimes miss um, God's people being taken care of. Um, a, a river to spew her away, uh, but the earth opening itself up and swallowing the river. Um, so again, so that the church is protected. So you notice that the, the two things here, that the dragon was enraged and went off after uh, to wage war against the rest of her offspring. That is, you know, you and I, modern day Christians, contemporary Christians. Um, so you, you sort of have the two things jostling together here. On the one hand, the real threat of, of the dragon, the real threat of Satan. On the other hand, the protection that God gives uh, to his faithful people. So uh, Revelation 2, uh, that, that one letter, right? Uh, Revelation 2.10, uh, so be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The constant call, be faithful. Because even though it looks like the world is, is going to heck, um, God is still the one in control. So, so that, that's Revelation um, chapter 12. Like I said, things seen from a cosmic view and how things then are today. Uh, the hits keep on coming in Revelation 13, because in Revelation 13, we have a vision of, uh, of two beasts. Um, the one comes out of the sea, and the one uh, comes out of the earth. Again, God in control in his heaven, right? Um, uh, here is the angel proclaiming the eternal gospel. Here is the angel with the sickle. Um, so all, a lot of the imagery that we're going to come into is right here. Um, and here are people worshiping the two beasts. So it's a terrible kind of vision. Let's start with the beast from the sea. And let's, uh, let's take a look at that real quickly here. And the beast from the sea is in Revelation chapter 13. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Now, remember, the sea is the... Uh, mythological place of evil. So to have something terrible come out of the sea is no big surprise to anybody. Um, and the beast comes out of the sea, 10 horns and seven heads with 10, 10 crowns. Um, 
similar to the dragon, right? The dragon had uh, seven heads, seven horns, and 10 crowns, I think it was, but sort of a similar kind of thing to the dragon. Um, each head had a blasphemous name on it, probably, uh, as we're going to come to see, uh, a shot at the Roman emperor, uh, because the Roman emperor claimed the title son of God, um, and that would have been blasphemous to a Jewish audience and to a Christian audience, because they knew who the son of God was. Uh, verse two, the beast resembled a leopard, but had feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. Uh, so really a crazy, a crazy kind of picture here. We're really drawing back on the book of Daniel, who also had um, the, an image of these kinds of beasts, and uh, they were described in very similar kinds of ways. So this is not just sort of made up new. This has deep biblical roots. Um, one, uh, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. And again, I, I kind of think that this is, this is John playing with us a little bit and doing double duty that um, I think this beast is meant to draw us to the idea of empire. Uh, I think that's probably what, what's going on uh, with this beast, that this particular beast from the sea is the power of empire, the power of conquest. The world plays by a certain set of rules. Uh, the world plays by the rules of um, violence and coercion. I'm going to get my way. Uh, we see it in our politics, right, where 51% um, uh, uh, gets to choose, you know, and that's how our elections have been for a long time, 51, 49, 50.6 to 50.4. We've had crazy close elections. Um, I'm not criticizing the Electoral College because, you know, personally, I like the Electoral College. Um, but you do see the frustration when um, in a presidential election, the losing candidate has got more people voting for him, but the system is rigged against him. So, again, I, I like the Electoral College. I understand what it's about. So I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying, though, but this is this is how the world plays games. Um, that we use coercion to get our way. We use force to get our way. Um, we see it, for example, in the US Senate where they've got this filibuster, but they don't actually have to filibuster. They just have to threaten the filibuster. And then suddenly you need 60 votes to break the filibuster. And it gives us just a great deal of power to, to wield and to, to throw a wrench in the works. Um, we, no wonder the Senate never gets anything done, right? I mean, no wonder Congress isn't anything done when we're playing with these slim, slim margins and we just learn how to force things. Um, we, we see it right now today um, in Russia and Ukraine. Um, this is how empires work. This is how the world works. Um, Russia has for the past month or so been massing troops on the Ukrainian border. Um, it is a way of saying, listen, you know, give us what we want, you know, or, or else. <clears throat> so the power of empire, the power of conversion, uh, co coercion, this is how the world gets things done. Um, and I think that's what this beast represents. It represents this power of, of violence, this power of empire. Uh, this is how the world is. Um, an analogy I like to use uh, to sort of get a handle on this is to imagine uh, the third grade playground. And on the third grade playground, um, you have a number of kids who are just really kind of big for third graders. Um, you know, one is named Egypt, and one is named Babylon, and one is named Rome. And, and these are big kids and they're bullies and they push the little kids around. And there's one third grader and he's really small and scrawny and just, you know, doesn't even look like he should be in third grade. And his name is Israel. And he gets beat up regularly. He gets beat up by Egypt and he gets beat up by Babylon. He gets beat up by Rome and he's had enough of it. 
So Israel's dream, especially in the era right around Jesus, the first, the century before him and the century after him, Israel's dream is that they want to grow up and they want to be bigger and stronger than these bullies. And they, they want that because they want to be the bully. They want to be the strong one on the playground. They want to bring some trouble down on Egypt. They want to bring some trouble down on Rome. Um, but God has a different plan, and Israel doesn't see it in this moment. God's plan is for a playground without bullies. So Israel wants to play by the world's rules. God wants to change the world's rules. And I think this is a problem for Christians all the time. I think we still want to play by the world's rules. It's why we get ourselves and our churches involved in politics so much, whether it's on the left or on the right. We can't seem to separate the, the cares and concerns of the kingdom from the cares and concerns of the nation that we live in. So um, the power of empire is, is on display here in this beast from the sea. And that, that's really all it is. It's not a single individual. It's not, you know, as Hal Lindsey used to worry, uh, one world order. It's not that kind of thing. It is instead a, a critique of the way that fallen humans typically get things done, which ends up being violence. Ends up being Cain killing Abel because he can't work it out for himself. It ends up being Rome oppressing Israel and Israel rising up in violent revolution against them, thinking that this time God is going to make us the stronger one and we're going to bring some trouble down on Rome. That's the power of empire that covers the, the whole age of this earth. Then there is a, a second beast that comes out of the sea and uh, out of the land, rather. And that beast, I think, will, rec will be recognized as the power of false religion. Um, let, let's sort of see what we're talking about there. Um, still in Revelation chapter 13. Um, come here, yeah. I saw a second beast coming out of the earth, two horns like a lamb. So again, mockery of Jesus. Now it's specifically cast in, in the religious terms, right? Jesus is the lamb. But it speaks with the voice of a dragon. And it exercises authority of the first beast and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. It performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven. That's like an Elijah mockery. Um, because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. That's the key word right there. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth for them to set an image and honor the beast who was wounded by the sword yet lived, given power to breathe breath to the image, to give breath to the image of the first beast, the image could be. Uh, this, this is all religious language, okay? That's the idea here. Um, this is all religious language. And it is religious language, especially in service of political power. Now, this was not so outrageous in, in the ancient world. Um, it really wasn't so outrageous even in the modern world. There has always been a close connection between power and religion. Um, Sumeria, Babylon, uh, these kings would were also the high priest. Uh, it's only in Israel that those two offices are separated. But um, the king was the high priest and the king was the one who was in communion with the gods. As the king's fortune went, that's how the gods favored the country. Um, Rome was the same way, um, a little different. Rome, um, Rome identified their emperors as sons of God, um, not Deus, which is the, one of the words for God, but Divus, which is a god, but sort of a lesser god. Uh, but there were shrines to any number of gods in Roman cities. And there were shrines to the emperor in cities across the empire. So religion and, and empire went hand in hand. I, I said it was the same thing into the modern era. 
And indeed it was. Um, in the Middle Ages and the early modern era, of course, in Europe, it was all monarchies, all kings, and the kings ruled by divine right. You know, it was um, very much a, a, a strange thing when philosophers and then the Americans said, no, kings, governments rule by the consent of the governed. Uh, that was a very new idea because it was always kings rule because God gave them the power. Uh, so there has been this strong interconnection between religion and um, a government through all of human history, this whole notion of the separation of church and state, very, very modern kind of stuff. And I'd like to share with you a quotation here from uh, Michael Gorman. Um, Gorman uh, writes a really good book on Revelation, not a verse by verse commentary, but a really good book on Revelation. Um, and he says, together, that is both beasts, the, the beast from the sea and the beast from the land, together, they speak of theopolitical megalomania. Frankly, the book is worth its price just for that phrase. Theopolitical, so politics mixed with theology. And together, they claim that they are the blessed of God. So the Romans really thought this. I mean, the Romans emphasize this a lot. Rome was so successful because the gods smiled on her. So when charges began to be placed against the Christians in the mid-second century, they were charged of atheism because they denied all the gods of Rome and they worshiped just this one invisible God they couldn't see, and therefore that was atheism. And because it was atheism, it was also sedition. See, they were charged with not supporting the state. And if you're not supporting the state, then in Rome's mind, you're working against the state. Christians were widely seen as seditious because of the way they worship only one God. Um, they, they didn't play with this, this uh, theopolitical idea that the gods love us. Uh, in one early um, defense of the Christian faith, uh, I forget what it's called now, um, the, the, the author makes the comment, he says, you know, we don't worship the emperor, but we do pray for him regularly. And that was a way of protecting themselves against this, it's again, this megalomania. So um, they speak of theopolitical megalomania and of any collaboration of political power and religious sanction that falsely claims to represent the true God and God's will. Well, there is so much more I could say about that because um, Americans often wrap our nation up in divine blessing. Our rhetoric about our own nation is not that different from the rhetoric that drove um, John to such distraction in, in the Roman Empire. It's not that different from the rhetoric of the Roman Empire. And, and we just do well once in a while to, to ponder that and to ponder the fact that um, uh, these are problematic kinds of behaviors for Christians. All right, one more thing in chapter 13. Um, this calls for wisdom, kind of an understatement. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast for it's the number of a man. Uh, that is 666. Just two brief things about 666. First of all, it ain't 777. That's kind of the first point. It's not 777. Um, 777 would look like the number of God. Uh, three sevens in a row, holy, holy cow, how much, how much more godly can you get? But this is 666, so this is, this is um, not of God, right? And this, this usurps God's place um, in the hearts of, of mankind. It, it, interesting that it does say it's the number of a man, and uh, there is a way that you can use Hebrew characters uh, for numbers. And I'm not really familiar with how it all works out. So I've just read other people smarter than me about it. And it turns out that if you add up the numbers for the name Nero, who would have been uh, the most wildly anti-Christian emperor in their memory, comes out to 666. 
So this again is just goes back to that whole notion of empire. Here's an emperor who is crazy, angry at Christians, um, and, and he is ungodly, and the whole power of the thing is ungodly. Finally, I want to take a look at chapter 14, um, just very briefly, because we're coming out of time here. Um, but here you have the 144,000 again. Again, this, this symbolic number for the totality of all of God's people. Um, they had not defiled themselves with women, probably a reference to um, pagan worship and, and the way that prostitution figured in, in pagan worship. Um, so, so here is a vision of God among uh, of the lamb and his people among all of that. And then there are three angels here. And I have just sort of broadly commented that these three angels are actually um, there as an assurance for God's people as judgment approaches. And they form a prelude to things that we'll see in the next two visions. So you have an angel here who proclaims the eternal gospel. Lesson number one, the church is in mission until Christ returns, and she can't stop it, right? So she is to proclaim the gospel. Uh, verse eight here, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, is expanded uh, to great extent um, back in, I think it's going to be chapter 17, chapter 18. We're going to come back to that a lot, lot more. And then uh, verse 9 through 12 here, um, this is going to uh, be a warning about worshiping the beast and, and the, the detriment of being wrapped up in that as opposed to being wrapped up in the one true God. So uh, the church's ongoing mission, which is a theme of Revelation, uh, judgment falling on God's enemies in, in both these other two paragraphs. Um, and then this, this little verse here, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, because they rest from their labor and their deeds follow them. So um, the, those who die in the faith are preserved as well. Uh, then we have these sort of images of judgment here, and they're a little repetitious, because first you have one seated in the cloud like the Son of Man, so here's Jesus. And he holds a sickle to reap because the time has come. So in the judgment, um, this is the reaping of the harvest, right? It's an image that Jesus himself uses, especially in Matthew 13, I think it is. Uh, but especially in Matthew, um, he uses this image of, of bringing in the harvest. And, and maybe this is a way of saying uh, that those who are his are harvested by the Son of Man himself and uh, on the last day, they are brought into his presence. On that same last day, though, there is an angel with uh, another sickle and uh, one who is in charge of fire, and they are to gather the clusters of grapes and then look at this, uh, trample them out in the great winepress of God's wrath. And um, they, they, they flow out blood. So the grape juice becomes like blood, and it, it really is an astonishing thing. A horse's bridle, probably five feet high, and 1,600 stadia, that's like, um, I don't know, 300 miles, something like that. Let's see if there's a footnote here. 180 miles for, for uh, 1,600 stadia. Uh, and the 1,600 stadia is probably just metaphor. Four times four times 10 times 10. Four being, you know, the completeness of earth, the four sides of the earth, the four corners of the earth. So probably just a, a saying that judgment comes upon the entire fallen earth. So again, you, you see some, some terrifying visions here, um, but they are visions about how the world is today, where power and religion are so often tied up together. Um, throughout, we have observed that there is language here about the protection of God's people in this time, that, that they're not going to be overcome by it, and that ultimately God will bring everything to its proper conclusion. Um, in some ways, this end of chapter 14 sounds a great deal like what Paul said um, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, the dead in Christ we raised first, so that is the blessed dead. And then we all will be taken up with him 
and then the judgment will come. So in some ways, all John has done here is repeat in very visual, stirring language what Paul said, um, maybe more straightforwardly, I guess, in 1 Thessalonians. The world's a mess, God's in charge, and he will bring all things to their proper conclusion. Again, let me just come back one last time before we quit today to our pictures here from Albrecht Durer. And just notice again that God is above it all. Here with the beasts and here with the dragon. God is above it all. That's really the message here. Everything unfolds according to God's plan and purpose and towards his own designs. <laughs> and no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens in your personal life, no matter what happens in our politics, no matter who's elected, um, you know, no matter what, what. The book of Revelation wants us to know God knows what's going on. In some ways, he's permitting it. It's always happening within the limits of what he has allowed. And he will bring it finally to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even in these most uh, crazy of passages in the book of Revelation, and let me tell you, a lot of commentators in Revelation come to chapter 13, especially. In spite of all of that, God remains God. He remains enthroned, and he will see things through. That's our confidence. That's our hope. Underscored again for us in the book of Revelation. Um, just FYI, uh, next week um, is uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's. I'm taking it as a vacation week. So there will not be a new video posted next Thursday, but I will come back with a video on December the 6th, the, the day of Epiphany, and we'll move our study forward into chapter 15. God bless. Take care.